the other well not the other day like two days ago did i tell you i woke up and i rolled out of bed and i put my feet on the floor and they were killing me my right foot in particular plantar fasciitis i have plantar fasciitis in my right foot so does from Adam. doing nothing i did nothing okay i was no, it's sick not your for a fault. week it's not i was fault. i was sick for a whole week okay <laughs> fever <laughs> body aches everything i'm finally getting out of it and then i just roll out of my bed and the my foot doesn't work Geriatric land sometimes. Your body knew. It's like, okay, 38. Turn it down now. All functioning body parts just power down. But it also doesn't make any sense. It's like <laughs> I had the flu. I was sick. I had the flu. I didn't go for like wind sprints or something. <laughs> I just had the flu. And then I woke up and it was like, well, your foot doesn't work now. Why? <laughs> uh, well, you were just laying down too long. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it was plantar fasciitis because it happened to my dad. From from the same sort of scenario? He just was like sick. And then right after he got sick, he called me up. He was like, beta, I need the hypervolt. <laughs> oh, it's like a God. massage gun. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, let me just drive two hours to bring you the hypervolt. Let's so rock. you're telling me I'm old enough to hang out with your dad now. <laughs> yes. Great. Your dad seems cool. That's a great way to start the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome to Product Happy Hour, everybody. My name is Jay Wagre. With me here is Ira Johal. Hey, Ira. Hello. What's happening? What kind of drink you got there? Uh, this is a paper plane. <laughs> Not the best one. It's a paper Not plane. Not the best. Okay. We paper read about plane. this liqueur that you used. What was, the, what was the name of the liqueur again? It's fancy. It's Amaro Nanino, an Italian um, bitters something. Made with and herbs for, and botanicals. And for everybody on the pod, I thought she made this up. I was like, wait a minute. What um, is I this your liquor? exact words were, did you just have a stroke? I think that's exactly what you said to me. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly what I said. Okay. So Amaro Nonino is a unique mm-hmm. Italian bitter liqueur that's worth seeking out. It's bittersweet with hints of caramel, vanilla, and allspice. There you go. That's what Amaro Nonino is. Can't and taste it doesn't any sound of that. like <laughs> it doesn't sound like, it doesn't sound like user having error, a good time though. with it. Yeah, user error over here. Okay. All right. Maybe you have to <laughs> did you check? Do you have to like put like ten portions of water to every like it's, one portion? Of there's a specific, you know, serving for each ingredient in this paper plane. And oh. I mean, I that's how I got a little buzzed is I, you know, trial and error. I was like, oh, this is supposed to taste better. Let me try this again. Okay. You know what's bad too is like I was using like the measuring cup for uh, cooking instead of the shot glass. Oh. It was like two thirds of a cup is close. <laughs> I don't think that's what that works. All the shot glasses like, are in the dishwasher. <laughs> I'm pretty sure a shot is an ounce and then two thirds of a cup is like, I, I mean, this is a bad time to be trying to do math in my head. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> if a cup is eight ounces, one third of a cup, all the engineers listening are just like, do the math, man. What's <laughs> wrong with you? It's like a little under three, like two okay. and two thirds, I guess. I don't know. Something like that. So and I so you basically poured. <laughs> yeah, you basically poured like five. That explains a lot. That explains a lot. <laughs> well, this is going to be a sounds like good it's a, pod. Stiff drink. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a really good. <laughs> it was supposed to be a cocktail. It's like, it's like it was. Full. Yeah, that thing is like you're like it looks it's like full. you're like just chugging Gatorade made out of, <laughs> made out of alcohol. <laughs> uh, that looks wonderful. Well, um, I've got uh, St. Arnold's lawnmower. Have you ever had that beer before? No, but it looks light. It's a it's a coal style beer. They make it out of Houston, mm. Texas. I actually figured out where this beer is made this time, and I actually really didn't have to figure it out because I love this beer. It's a it's a good one, and I knew they made it in Houston. Shout out to Houston. That's great. 
Mm. And we got some merch. Look at that. Product happy hour uh, beer glass here. Oh, you can see it. Almost Dude, see it. You can see it. My wife uh, got this made for me. Oh, there. Um, totally see it. We got some merch. She also got me this sign. We're on the air. I don't know if you do, but we're on the air. <laughs> Good stuff today. Um, how's your day? Do you have a lot of meetings? Okay. Why not even ask? We're product people. Of course we had a bunch I of I had meetings. a meeting with a Jay today. Oh, yeah. Worst meeting of the whole day. <laughs> what did we get we done? Actually, Nothing? Okay. We, well, we actually had to work and think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was a rough, and it was like after 3 o'clock my time. Which is like, mm, you know, yeah. 6 a.m. to 3 a.m. like shot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You work, you work, in, you work uh, really early hours. So you're pretty much out there at 6 a.m. Done at, done at 3 p.m. though, which is nice. Yeah. That's, but productivity uh, takes a real tank, you know, those later <laughs> meetings. Yeah, I know what you mean. You just kind of start running out of gas. I get that. Uh, well, cool. We're, we're going to talk about working with designers today. That's right bad. after the engineering pod, we're going straight into the designer pod. That's uh, that's pretty sweet. Designers. We love working with designers. The designers. They're, role. The, it's really great, huh? I mean, I think when I became a product manager, the idea of getting to work with design and, and being interested in design and caring about design was a huge draw of the job, no? Yeah, I immediately felt cooler for like knowing designers, let alone working with them. I'm like, oh. Your art and science. Look at you. Yeah, it's really, uh, it's really a great profession. You get to learn so much about, you know, of course, technology and and how users um, think about your products and stuff. But also just like color theory and shapes and like what people are drawn to and the psychology of stuff. It's like really, man, what a cool job. I, I, a lot of the people I know that are designers, uh, when I work with them, I'm just like jealous. I'm like, man, if only I could just like do make pretty things all day that's uh and that sounds great interaction patterns like the research that they have and like i feel like also it's kind of like a superpower when you can like just change the way something looks and it can immediately change the effectiveness it's like yeah. total unlock when you have good design for your product like massive unlock Totally, totally. Yeah, it, it really is a huge unlock, huge, um, huge jump in capability when you have some, uh, uh, when you have a designer on the team. Um, a great designer can really just completely unlock the potential of a team. So, yeah, hugely important role. Uh, so let's go. Let's talk about working with designers. Woo, let's get into it. first time you saw the light when was okay. the first time you saw the light and you were like wow design designers so critical <laughs> yeah so this is gonna date me but i was in line for like the very first iphone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and obviously everyone knows apple is you know very cutthroat when it comes to design um and they're kind of the gold standard now but back then you know i was on that flip phone green screen snake playing verizon phone <laughs> oh yeah yeah i love that game snake. um we all know it and, yeah and the screens um that were shown for the iphone were just like whoa um, that looks cool and so I, I think that was the first time i was dazzled by design in like a very memorable way but you know throughout my experience especially now being a product manager i'm kind of my brain is kind of tuned to compare different interfaces for the same thing like, I think we've talked about this before, Spotify versus Apple Music. Yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes design will just get me to buy something without me even using it for functionality. Just like if the if the look is slick and the patterns look smooth and consistent, I feel like I can trust that product more. And so I think now, like, I, I kind of even use that as, like, the first bar to get over. Like, does it look it's cool? It's definitely like an entry point. It's like when mm -hmm. you see something that's like very well designed, very well thought out, it's like, okay, I'm going to consider this product. I'm going to consider yes. it more than I probably would have would have otherwise. And I definitely hear you on the iPhone stuff. I still remember when I was when they were first announcing the iPhone and Steve Jobs was doing his whole thing. It was like, yeah, it's a phone. 
It's a touchscreen iPod. It's an internet communicator, a phone, an iPod. I was just like, dude, we still, I, at Verbo, we used to just always make that joke of just like every presentation should just start with a little <laughs> spinning cube in the background. Oh my God, that that presentation really made a mark on me too. And the product did too. It was really, um, yeah, it really speaks to what 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 design can really bring to the table when when enabled properly. Um, yeah, my my exposure was I was working with a startup. Um, it was kind of like my first exposure to product management. And in the startup, we had we had worked with um, a series of designers. And like the first designer we worked with, he helped us put wireframes together. And just these wireframes, not only was it like the wireframe quality was so high, it was just mm-hmm. the bar was really high, but just how well thought out everything was it really showed to me just how like if you have a great designer not only are they like putting to picture what you think about talk about put words against paper on Uh but just like they elevate so much of it to the next level if their powers are harnessed properly and and yeah you uh work effectively as a team man they can really they can really elevate so that was the first time i was like oh my gosh okay design so it's a, it's an amazing function, right? And um, working with designers effectively is is a really really important skill. Uh, maybe we should hop into the bullet points. That uh, Let's that sound good? Jump into it. Yep. Let's go. All right. You want to start us off with the with the first few? Yes. Um, so first point is to be the dynamic duo of your broader team. What are a few dynamic duos? You ask the Mario and Luigi. The Lucy and Ethel, the Jerry Seinfeld and George George Costanza. There are more, right? I would argue it was more like Seinfeld and Kramer, but yeah, you're. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good point. George is a little, yeah, maybe uh, less on the designy, positive side. Uh, yeah. So why is this important? I think you know when we contrast the relationship of you and your designer with you and your engineering manager or your broader engineering team, uh, we, you know, you recognize that your designer is actually more like your strategy partner and probably someone you want to bring in early. Uh, but I think the key part of being a dynamic duo is to understand that your designer is actually your resource. Um, and so use them um, as a partner and less like a stakeholder. And they can unlock all kinds of cool things for you. We're going to get into like the type of research or, you know, things you can rely on your designer for in order to get to a product vision or a productionalized feature and and what designers actually contribute there. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is a, this is a great point. When, when you initially had, had shared a lot of these points, I saw this first one and I was like, man, this is it right here. I mean, I don't think I really realized it um, until you kind of kind of put it to words. But really, yeah, your designer is like in the in the cockpit with you. You are mm-hmm. like you are really um, tied to the hip in a lot of ways on on critical projects that you're working on. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this hundred percent, pretty much every um, every great project that we've been able to execute on. Uh, that that I've been able to execute on has had a really great designer, gr- great designer pairing to really bring that to life and and um, you know treating them as somebody that's kind of in it with you is um, yeah. is really important to make sure that you have successful projects and, and great quality work. Have you ever worked with like a super super serious designer? <laughs> well, I think <laughs> a lot. I mean, <clears throat> I love designers and I love all of the designers listening to this pod. Um, I, I think a lot, all of designers are pretty serious. I feel like you have to be, if you're going to, you know, do the level of work that, mm-hmm. that's, that's needed, uh, I agree. you have to be very serious about your craft. Um, the attention to detail part, right? I mean, like they're examining yeah. every pixel. Um, and if you change strategy or change a user problem or the definition of success, they have to move with you. And so I feel like. Yeah. The best designers that I've worked with are battle tested and they've kind yeah. of like, when I say serious, I mean like they don't take any BS. 
They don't. Um, and, and I mean, they shouldn't. I mean, I think um, it's a it's a really challenging craft. Uh, I mean, just like engineering, too. Right. Like you don't want to be sitting in front of an engineer just, you know, talking, <laughs> talking over just them while they're it. doing serious work all the time. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, <laughs> and uh, so it's the same with design. I mean, uh, it's a very serious profession. So um, but, you know, I feel like um, with most most people on the team, it's always good to to have fun and uh, enjoy yourselves and, and try to leave space for that. So, you know, I tried and I, and you do a really good job of this too. Um, it, just trying to keep some space for, for fun, for creativity and, uh, and being able to work together as a team in that way um, is really important. Even, even though what we're doing is, is really mm-hmm. important and serious, you know, keeping that space I like is, that approach. is really critical. Yeah. that And that brings me to my next point, um, which is just, how to unlock the unique skills your designer ha- has. Um, and I think the best way to do that is to actually let them lead. And I'm not saying like, oh, you should have your designer do all the legwork. I mean, there is a really big part of most product execution that includes uh, partnering and throw- bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, but at some point, you got to you got to make the assist because designers do have really good skills. And just because you know how to wireframe or, you know, Photoshop doesn't mean you should, you know? Um, And so just like respecting the discipline is really important and and also understanding what type of designer you have. Like, are they well-versed in like interaction patterns? You should find that out early. Um, Do they prefer that you actually create wireframes before they move into mock state or prototype um having those kind of conversations earlier mm. will just make you more effective you know recognize those unique skills um and give them their runway um to do with it what they wish with the right amount of time and boundaries you mentioned something uh, really good there which is just trying to figure out how best to work together right at the beginning mm-hmm. and trying to figure out methodologies uh for working together yeah, that's really smart. I, um, I, I'm thinking back on previous experience working with designers, trying to figure out the best ways to work together is is really important. You know, if you're if you're kind of the the kind of person that just loves to kind of mock it up yourself yeah. <laughs> and then send it over, um, that's probably not going to sit well with every designer. That's right. Um, out there, and you might not get the best work. I mean, actually, I've actually found that the more you can kind of keep things open ended. And um, really, um, not just challenge, but allow your designers that have that skill set that can really bring something to life in a way better than you can. Um, giving that space and giving some more flexibility there, man, can really make a project go to the next level instead of just, you know, <clears throat> handing everything off and, uh, yeah. or being super detailed and saying exactly how you want something done. Right. Um, you know, leaving that space for designers to really create is really can really can really unlock some really great, really great ideas and, and great, um, great, ultimately designs. Yeah. And good decision making. I like the way you frame that. I, I tend to think of designers as co-pilots, no matter what type of designer, like they're going to be able to make the right call um, if you give them the opportunity. And yeah, let's keep going with this cockpit analogy. But there have been many a times where, you know, I was ready to make a decision or a call and I just, you know, uh, paused for a moment to get the perspective of my designer before I shared more broadly, you know, and the challenge or acceptance was helpful. Um, It was helpful. And and that's what I really mean about being a partner and trusting that they have a unique set of skills, figuring out what those skills are, and then just stepping the hell back. Yeah. (laughs) It's okay not to be involved in everything. I know. I should have had someone design this drink. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah uh, so Maybe it's getting water I, I mean, down I, now oh that's good yeah. <laughs> that probably helps a lot uh, you know i know you know uh designer friends that know how to great make a great cocktail and engineering friends so next time maybe <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should give them a call yeah like every time we film all right <laughs> yeah maybe. uh mine's easy i just take a beer and I'm just like done <laughs> I should do that next time. Yeah. Okay, let's it's let's nice. go into point three. Yeah. Did you sure. see that? I was like point three as I showed four fingers. Wow, with your hand. 
There you go. Okay. Killing it. Strong drink, guys. Strong drink. Okay. Uh, don't be the bottleneck. Um, I, Killer. Yeah, I've done this. I've done this. I don't know. Something about, and I've met other PMs like this too. I don't know what it is about the PM role that kind of like makes you think you have to be a perfectionist and like micromanage everything. I don't know. Maybe it's, I don't know if it's causal or correlative, but um, empowering mm. direct collaboration uh, between eng and design and research um, is going to be very, very useful for you. It, like I said, you have a co-pilot, um, let them um, actually do their job and don't be the broker of every single decision. Just let some of them go. Yeah. This one took me a while to learn as well. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. Did it take you a long time? Yeah, I was going to say it's comforting to hear that because okay. I was yeah. like, oh, yeah. let me show, let me put us on a group Slack thread. Yeah. Yeah. I, I it took me a while to learn this. And um, I think actually for those of you that maybe, maybe you're like, kind of in mid-level junior for product. Um, this actually kind of helped me unlock the senior level um, was just kind of getting out of the way a little bit Ooh. when it was better to have design um, kind of lead things with engineering or, or not be the bottleneck between design and engineering and just having them work through, work through things directly um, mm -hmm. and having me come in and, and tie break or, help clarify for decision-making as needed. Um, that ultimately kind of helped unblock my ability to do, you know, bigger projects and help more and contribute in more ways to the company. Um, and I think honestly it just made for better products, you know, you know, things don't get lost in translation as much. Um, you know, design and engineering gets bonded a little bit more. Yes. Um, they trust each other design, more. They trust each other more. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And it just, yeah, I mean, it's just all around um, a better experience for the team to in foster and encourage, you know, design to work more directly with engineering and vice versa and um, just kind of help get things done in that way. I mean, it really, totally. this is this is a great point. When you, when you wrote this, I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> and it takes a while. It It's hard to kind of get out of this pattern of feeling like you're, responsible for everything in product yeah. you are but that doesn't mean you should be getting in the way of of teams doing great work together i totally agree and and your point about unlocking senior um which is just like giving people autonomy not having to rubber stamp every single change um i mean how else do you free time up if, if you have to make every call and you have no partners that you trust i mean that's really going to strain your time and i think it might even put a few blinders on there. I mean, back to, you know, system one, system two, like, and also just the biases we have of ourselves, having another pair of eyes that you trust, um, and that can operate autonomously is, is a really good way uh, to have more room to do product thinking, uh, versus, yeah. you know, looking at every single pixel, making every single decision, running every single, you know, design strategy meeting. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Super important. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about strategy. So Number four. it's really important to align on vision and problem statement early um, with your designer. I mean, you might not have, I mean, many of you may not have a user facing product. Maybe it's backend, maybe it's tooling. Um, maybe you're a data PM, but um, still, if you're using a designer of any kind, visual, an architect, anything like that, you really want to get crystal clear on what problem you're solving and have that open and honest discussion uh, about what the solution might look like, what it might feel like. Um, and this is really good to do early, as I mentioned, because I have been burned before, which is like, <laughs> and, the, and the fallout is having to walk a designer back um, from a solution that just like you did a crappy job explaining to be, to be totally fair. Yeah. I'm thinking about a major failure that I had just trying to work on a design project. Um, I think I told you about this, like <clears throat> I was asked to do like a full 
redesign of our consumer experience. And um, when we embarked on this redesign, we hadn't done a lot of supporting research about mm. what the vision is for the redesign, what problems we were trying to solve that were vetted and deeply rooted in true customer problems. We just kind of had a list of like things that we felt like we should solve. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> or things that we thought were good ideas. And so we went, we, we embarked on this redesign. Um, I think everybody was really excited and we were kind of working through a lot of really interesting challenges, but when it actually came to a checkpoint to share what we were working, working on with, you know, our stakeholders, my boss and like uh -huh. the broader team, I just remember the look on my boss's face and just being like, <laughs> what happened here? And oh, no. it was just kind of like this sort of amalgamation of like different concepts, you know, ideas. Um, and it was a very painful but necessary lesson in just how much better your design can really be um, and your designers can, can really be by enabling them with a strong vision, a strong yes. set of problem statements that's really rooted in customer insight and data both qualitative and quantitative data. So what, what people talk about with qualitative and then what, what your um, data tells you in your data lake and, and your data systems with quantitative. Um, being being super rooted in that, so much better designs. We I did another project after that mm -hmm. that was much more rooted in in customer insight and, and that type of data, way better, so much better. And um, I think my boss, same boss, was just like yeah. night and day, you know. Um, so this is this is really really critical, especially as you get, you know, uh, up into the higher levels. You're trying to scale, you know, having this type of deep insight, man, can really make or break uh, a project and make or break a relationship with a designer for sure. Ugh, I'm I'm totally laughing because I have so been there. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I like can Cold sweats. cringe at my, Yeah, I can cringe at myself now, but oh, if I could have helped myself out there, uh, maybe maybe it'll be helpful if I share this specific example. So, uh, a company that shall be not be named <laughs> gets millions and millions of users um, to list items for sale, and buyers buy them. And uh, one really, you know, important business model is helping those sellers get those items up on this platform. And uh, we are building a recommendation service that would essentially fill the item specifics, describe the item for you, and even help price it for you based on like the title, for example. Um, and what was really interesting about that is instead of over designing, like we mentioned, you know, like being the bottleneck or having a rubber stamp. I, and I actually under communicated the problem that needed to be solved to my designer. Um, mm. And in this case, I was like, oh yeah, you know, we want to recommend a price to them. Uh, and so what is that going to look like in this flow? Uh, and essentially, you know, the designer came back with like, if I told that to you, Audrey, you'd be like, okay, cool. I guess we'll uh, put the recommended price in the price box. Like most sane people would do. <laughs> but the obvious problem with that was is that I didn't describe uh, the user problem or the actual broader vision um, to this designer. Um, and the broader vision was actually to give that seller confidence um, that they could trust uh, not only the platform, um, but also this numerical value on this good they're trying to list, this price. Um, and that confidence was a big reason why users weren't getting to the end of, you know, actually listing their item. Um, so this designer comes back with like, you know, a very simple UI, which says, okay, uh, well, here is the price and here is the price box. And here is the price in that price box. Problem solved. And I was like, no, 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 what is this? What is this? This, this, I'm not, this doesn't make me feel confident. And they're like confident. Yeah. It's already in the box. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah, basically mm. we didn't really align on the, this, you know, added, and very important component of encouraging confidence and trust, trusting this price, right? Uh, yeah. And I didn't describe that that was actually, you know, the number one reason people didn't complete the flow, um, you know, from lots of surveys, uh, quant and qual. Um, and the design, uh, you know, is was very different once they had that context. 
Um, and yeah. I, I waited to the last minute to actually review the design, Ajay. So oh. then I had to pressure this poor designer to think through this like bigger thing with a very short window of time, um, which is no fun for anybody. Yeah, it's not. It's a man learning these lessons in these really tough environments and like and just sometimes sometimes very publicly. Yeah. Really, really, really helpful, actually, in the long run. <laughs> it's so painful when you're going through it. First but, happens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, once you learn them, really important. Hopefully people that are listening uh, can take some of our advice and and maybe skip a few steps uh, get burned. And, and not get burned like that. So. All because um, they attended happy hour. Look at that. Yeah, look at you. You just have a beer and just chill and, and listen to uh, all of our screw-ups and, yeah. uh, you know, try not to do them again. <laughs> Save yourself from uh, public embarrassment at a massive company. That's right. Very public, <laughs> very visible embarrassment. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a, that's a real thing to try to avoid if you can. And your um, designers right. might stay uh, your friends, which is another point. Maybe. You always want good designer friends. For lots of different reasons. You can go to their house and get a nice espresso uh, and talk about <laughs> photography. Those are very rewarding things. Just kidding. Just kidding. That's not no, every designer. Like, but a lot of them. Your, don't ever ask your designer friends to build a logo for your startup. That's a really quick way to lose designer friends. Like, well, you could just mock this up, right? They're like, uh, Famous no. last words. Famous last words. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it here. Okay. Shall we move on to number five? Yes. Let's go. Let's right. go for it. Design isn't just about looks. It's about how users interact. This is really Ooh. good too. Um, and especially nowadays, because I think, you know, before there was a separation between UI designers and UX designers. UI being like user interface designers and UX mm -hmm. being user experience designers. That's right. For a long time you'd see them as kind of like separate job descriptions. Now it's just kind of like if you're a designer, you're doing both. And um and I actually really like this because designers that um, when they're when they're doing both, I feel like they can really dig into the problem space. UX designers, you know, and, and UI designers combined really can dig into it and do and do the user interface design. Um, and so empowering your designer by giving them the time to leverage or perform research, build per, uh, personas and define the interaction patterns as well as look and feel really can pay off. You can, yeah. you can really I get mean, better projects, get, better features, more well thought out implementations, super, super advantageous to the whole team. Really well said, really well said. I mean, there's, I, I think now the research part of it is kind of wrapped into it too. Um, yeah. Spoiler alert, but I like have learned about the progression of a designer's role through running design or attending designer interviews. I mean, mm -hmm. they're doing like human computer interaction design now. Um, you know, there's some expected level of uh, doing their own research or at least partnering with the research arm of your company if you have one. Um, and all those things are going to do nothing but pad the performance and the final delivery of your product. Uh, I really, yeah, really like the, the way best you said designs that. are. Yeah. Cause the best designs are rooted in customer insight. I mean, like we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. it's not only a, a key to avoiding a ton of embarrassment. It's also just the best way to create the best designs is to be hyper familiar with your users, what problems they're trying to solve. Um, and um and just being being really really in tune with that and yeah like you said like having more of uh of these sort of what used to be separated designer responsibilities kind of in one in one role really helps you be more and more in touch with uh in touch with what's going on with your customers and your business um and just you just get much much better designs that way um yeah. which is great so empowering that is it's just going to make everybody uh, including your designer that much better. That's totally true. So maybe let me ask you this. What has been, uh, well, what have you learned uh, from your designer about interaction patterns or pers personas? Like I, this is a quick sidebar. Like I really didn't know that vocabulary until, um, I empowered a designer to kind of walk me through those things. So I was like, Oh, okay. 
I just kind of like sat back and pretended like I didn't know a lot or that I had this limited scope. Um, have you learned anything or have there been any times where, you know, your designer provided like a big unlock in terms of how people interact with the different placements or features? Um, uh, you know, what I really like when, when you kind of empower a designer to, to take over and, and really uh, spend some time looking at it in that way is that they can bring a fresh set of eyes to things like um, there are, you know, especially right in the beginning when they're first joining the team. Um, oftentimes what will happen is there have been flows that I've been looking at for like literally years sometimes. And it just will kind of washes over me that, mm. oh yeah, that flow works that way. And that's just kind of how it is. And then when a new designer will come through <laughs> and they'll like, they'll just be like, I didn't really love this flow. It's not very efficient. So here's a 10,000 times better one. Yeah. And you're like, oh <laughs> so God, true. okay. Uh, I guess in that way, you just kind of learn that everything can be improved. Everything can be um, not just optimized, but rethought, done better. Um, and uh, and that's really wonderful in that way. Like um, that. But also just, yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's always a really wonderful thing when, uh, especially when designers are first starting. Uh, that that's just it's just great. I I every time I I, I learn something new when, when especially when somebody new starts. Uh, but then fresh sometimes when we're uncovering, yeah, fresh pair of eyes. Sometimes when we're doing overhauls, like we just got done with an overhaul um, in in a part of, in a certain part of the experience, um, and uh, man, yeah, sometimes when a designer really kind of walks through and rips that apart, mm. you just find all these little nuggets of how things work today, and then mm. how how uh, your new thing changes that. It's always it's always a surprise. There's always something I find where I'm like, oh, that thing worked like that. I had... <laughs> so, so, I totally uh, so yeah, <laughs> having a great, a great designer is just such a, man, it's such a huge, uh, huge unlock for, for everything. Um, it's, it's really great. Uh, should we move on to number six? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of these last ones are kind of carry over from our working with engineers pod, which is our last episode. You should check that one out as well if you haven't. Um, learn some design fundamentals and tools, even, even minor fundamentals like color theory, um, you know, fonts, uh, the difference between sans serifs and serifs is, and how those things are constructed. Um, they're not just like just fun things to talk about at parties. Um, really, really <laughs> good things to know and understand and help you relate more to the designer that you're working with, the tools that they're working with, how a lot of that stuff works. Um, really helpful. If nothing else, to just kind of build, build uh, trust and and credibility in the relationship. But you know, it also is just good to know, good to know yeah. how that stuff works. Same and reason that you would learn it for engineering. I like that. You still often share, um, you know, screenshots, wireframes, prototypes out of these tools. Knowing your way around your designer's most commonly used tool, like, can we drop names here? Like Figma, um, mm -hmm. Sketch. Uh, understanding how uh, those work, how to navigate around them, how how your designer best likes feedback. Is it in that tool? Is it, um, you know, in whatever communication tool your company uses? Is it in person? Is it in, is it in a meeting? Is it through a carrier pigeon? I don't know. Um, but getting familiar with those tools and their communication style is probably going to help you move a lot quicker. And yeah, as you said, AJ, uh, build some empathy and trust. Yeah, totally. Last two, um, be data informed. Number seven, um, same thing from uh, from the engineering pod as I mentioned. But man, especially with designers, they're they're bringing so much to the to the table in terms of like user research and and visual design, interaction design. There was a period I think in in uh, especially in my career path where I kind of felt like uh, the designers that I was working with mm -hmm. were filling in so many gaps that previous to having a great, great designer on the team, I was filling in that at a certain point I was like, man, what is my usefulness here in this relationship <laughs> now, instead of just being a talking head that shows up in meetings all the time. <laughs> and, um, I, I think that, uh, relationship got even stronger once I started leaning into more of what I could contribute from a product perspective, okay. strategic analysis, but also just data analysis, better understanding customers, better understanding data, 
uh, qualitative data, quantitative data, especially, yeah. um, and offering that to your designer as a way to kind of shape the work, shape the conversation of where things need to go. Um, leaning into that was a really, really big, big help and kind of balancing out the relationship between, between product and design. So, you know, if you can lean into that strength and provide that to your design, I think I would bet that you would probably get even better work um, when you, the two of you are working together. What would you say is like the right time? Would you say just in the beginning, maybe always Anytime. along the way? <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> I mean, even things that you would think maybe not so helpful, you know, um, mm -hmm. like there was this big research project that we were, that we were, we had done, um, on one of the teams I was on where we were kind of researching how the marketplace worked. Um, and we were doing a lot of, of quantitative research on how people, you know, use different parts of the experience, how often they're moving through it, what their conversion rate looks like when they're in different cohorts and stuff. That's and, a good amount um, of data. It's a, man, good to know. There's still, there's, I, uh, I would revisit that report over and over and oh, over again, okay. and I'd still learn something new every time. Huh. Um, and when we finished this first phase of the report, I looked at it and I was like, I don't know how much of this is going to be super useful to the team out of the gate, but yeah, let's just share it and right. let's just start talking about it. And I was kind of amazed at how quickly the designer I was working with got back and was just like, oh, I have like 50 ideas just on what you shared in that five minute uh, section of stand up. And I was like, okay, so we got to like, just keep sharing this <laughs> stuff all the time because <laughs> you just don't know. You just never know what's going to land. Um, oh yeah. And, um, even just early stuff is, is super, super helpful. Right. And, and like thinking of yourself as like a conduit to like a connection point, like they don't have time to be always running their own research or necessarily reading every piece of research that gets posted or watching, you know, your dashboards. Um, so doing that digestion too, that, like you said, like, you know, in stand up hitting these few bullet points or sharing the broader report out, um, is going to be really key too. Um, to yeah. just like getting them, getting your team, well, a well-informed team is that much stronger, right? Like if you're the only one yeah. holding the cards and they're all just like doing, uh, I don't know, I guess their, their portion or remaining in that silo or being uninformed, you know, why, why, why it's like yeah. broaden why? their horizons with that data. That's right. Free your minds. Free. Okay. Um, <laughs> last one, fill in the gaps. <laughs> It's always important to fill in the gaps. I mean, I we talked about this in the engineering uh, engin in the engineering pod, but I also think it's equally as important as a designer uh, and working with a designer. If you got to do production design work, you could always try to do that, cut assets and stuff. Although things like Figma make that a lot easier. Um, but also, like you know, if you can help interview customers, you can help um, you know fill out user personas or whatever anything you can do to help a designer kind of focus on the things that you can't do mm -hmm. like design, uh, always going to be super helpful in that, in that working relationship, uh, to just fill in the gaps and pick up, pick up what you can to, to move the ball forward. That is the PM's role. Just be the fall guy and be the slack picker upper. Is that a word? Yeah. Slack picker upper? I, I, you know, I'd put that in, I'd put it in a job description. Sure. <laughs> Slack you're just picker upper. I, yeah, it's not it's not explicitly written out sometimes, but yeah, I mean you're in the mud. You're just mm -hmm. trud, you know, you're in the mud with everybody. And, you know, when you're in the mud, you don't want to be the anchor. You gotta be like, you know, pushing everybody forward and um yeah, that's like key part of the job. So just as important in design as it is in engineering. Well, I think we hit some really good points here. All right, should we recap? Yes, let's recap. I'll uh, take the it. first uh, top half. All right. So first, be co-pilots, be the dynamic duo. Um, number two, uh, recognize unique skills your designer brings and let them lead. Number three, just get out of the way. Don't be the bottleneck and empower them. Number four, align on vision and problem statement early. And as Edgy said, maybe along the way as well. That's right. Uh, number five, design isn't just about looks. It's about how users interact. So you should empower your designer um, to, you know, do research, build personas, et cetera, uh, to make that happen. 
Number six, learn some design fundamentals and tools. You'll pick up Figma. You know, you can check out Figma whenever you want. It's in the cloud. It's super helpful. Learn about fonts, color theory, you know, some of the basics of design. Uh, super helpful. Be data informed. Really lean into providing that value as a PM to to designers to kind of unblock their thinking and, and move the ball forward. And fill in the gaps. Get in the mud. Push the pile forward. Really help the team succeed. Help your designers succeed. Really critical as a PM. Oh, my God. And that's working effectively with designers. So clutch. So clutch. We did it. I don't know why we... I just clapped right in front of my head. What's wrong with me? <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we uh, we hope you enjoyed the episode. Smash that like button. Uh, leave us a Follow. comment. Follow us uh, on uh, Spotify, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Um, check us out on YouTube if uh, if you like to listen there. And uh, we'll be back sometime next week uh, with another episode. And thanks so much for joining us for Project Happy Hour. Bye, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye.